who took part in our service this morning, and as our hymns and as the title of the message and the passage, if you're familiar, indicate we're going to be talking about heaven today. And basically, with this passage, Christ is leaving his forwarding address. He's told the disciples he's, he's, he's not going to be with them very much longer, but he's going to tell them where he's headed, and he's going to tell them where to find him and that they're going to be with him soon. So he, he says... He says, this is where I'm going to be, this is the address, this is how you get a hold of me. And, and that's going to be comfort. And, and that's really going to be the theme of chapter 14, is a comfort from the Lord. But let's look together at John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. And if you would, stand with me for the reading of God's word. John 14, 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Amen and amen. Dearest Heavenly Father, we thank you that we know Christ is in heaven even now, interceding for us and preparing a place for us, Lord. Please help us to look forward to that day, to to rejoice in the hope of heaven. But as we remain here on earth, Lord, help us to keep that joy in everything of our lives. Please guide this time and guide my lips in moving your spirit, Lord. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So this morning we're going to consider Christ's residence, Christ's return, and Christ's road. As I said, chapter 14 is really one of comfort from Christ to his disciples. So all uh, before messages, it's all the words of comfort and and then some more specific aspect of that. He's gotten over giving them some very challenging and, and saddening revelations. So here he encourages them with this information. And it's a... These are promises that are good for us today. So in the the challenges and struggles of life, these comforts and joys are still for us. And the first one here is a very famous passage, the promise of heaven. But Christ makes abundantly clear, heaven's a wonderful place, but there's one way to get there, and it's through him. So Christ's residence we find in verses 1 and 2. He says, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Think of what we've just seen in chapter 13. Christ just told the disciples that one of them, this intimate, tight-bound group, was going to betray him unto death. And remember, they still didn't know which one it was. They thought Judas was going out for supplies. So they're, they're, they're tormented that one of them is going to betray him, and they don't know who. He's told them that he's leaving them, and they cannot follow him. And he told them, Peter, their spokesman, he was going to betray the Lord. So think of the, 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 the emotional state of the disciples right now. I think you could have heard a, a pin drop in the room at that point. They're, they're in anguish. They're, they're, they're wrestling. This is, a, this is a dark time for them. They're very reasonably upset, but Christ has a word of encouragement. Let not your heart be troubled. So notice here we've got the change from thy to now your. Remember, that's got the two lines, so Christ is speaking to multiple. So contrary to what some commentators say, this is not just directed at Peter. He's backed up, and now he is directing the whole room at this point. Each of you, don't let your heart be troubled. This is an imperative. It's a command. Don't do it. Don't allow all these things I've told you To get you down, don't let them, as we talk that word trouble, think of churning waters. Don't let them stir up your heart, stir up your human emotions to sorrow or despair. So we see here that troubling is something that external things do to us. Situations, circumstances, they are like the rock that's dropped in the pond and stirs up the water. But we don't have to let them do that. We don't have to let circumstances dictate our emotions and our feelings. Now, Being troubled is not a sin. We've seen several times Christ himself was troubled as he looked on sin and as he looked on the effects of the curse on death and that stirred him up. It troubled him. And those things should trouble us as well. But we don't need to stay troubled. Being troubled is not a sin, 
but it certainly can degenerate into a sin, a sin of worry, a sin of faithlessness. So we, we can never let being disturbed by things outside of us lead us into to worry or despair. But being troubled is not the state that God desires believers to live in consistently. And I think you can see all the religions of the world that preach works, or those that preach you'll, you'll, you can lose your salvation and you've got to wait to the end to see if you hung on to it or not. The, even great Christian preachers that believe those sorts of things, their writers indicate a troubled soul. The, the great Puritans that they believed that if they persevered, it would show that they were the elect. They had no peace. They, they were troubled. They, they, they didn't grasp the hope of heaven because they weren't sure it was for them. And their, their latter days are full of trouble. That's not what Christ wants for us. That is not how he desires the Christian life to be lived. He desires for us to have assurance that we need not be troubled, that we look forward to the joys of heaven. And Christ says this in the shadow of his own death. As Christ looks at the cross looming in less than a day, he says, let not your hearts be troubled. So this promise is good for us even in the darkest days of life, even in the shadow of death. Our hearts don't need to be troubled. Because we have the joy and the hope of heaven. He tells them, you believe in God, believe also in me. They don't need to be troubled because of the faith they have and the faith that they should have. They all have faith in God the Father. All the disciples were raised observant Jews. They knew about the one true God, Jehovah, the covenant-keeping God. So they, they trusted in Him. And now they have more revelation of the Father through Jesus Christ, but now Christ urges them to believe on Him too. Believe also in me, that, that in, ace is the word, into. That's salvation language. But at this point, the eleven were all saved, but Christ is still saying, believe on me. He says, you've trusted me for your eternity, now trust me for today. You've trusted me, you have dedicated three years of your life to me, don't let that lag. Keep trusting in me. And, and that's good for us today that, yes, our salvation, our trust in God in that way is once for all, but don't let that be it. In, in every matter, in everything that could trouble us, put our faith in Christ about that. Give it over to Him. The life of the believer must trust and rely on and, and have confidence in Christ for eternity and for today. For the challenges and sorrows that come day by day. And we need to, it's not just knowing that Christ can handle it. I'm sure we all know that Christ has everything under control. That Christ clothes the, the flower of the field and, and watches the sparrow. But do we put that trust in him? Do we, do we put our reliance in him then? It's like I might know my car can get me from point A to point B. But am I willing to get inside of it and step on the gas? That's what we've got to do with Christ. Not just know what he can do, but live that out in our lives and, and not allow things to trouble us because we're giving it over to him. But this is an interesting comparison to the people of Israel at large. Israel as a whole said they believed in God, but they rejected God's son. They rejected the only one who brought true revelation of the Father. That is Christ Jesus. So believe in God, believe also in Christ. Because they didn't believe in Christ, this promise is not good for, for the nation of Israel as a whole, the unbelieving nation. Because we're going to see in a bit here, it just knowing there's a God or believing in some higher power, that doesn't cut it, that Jesus is the only way of access. But in that statement, believe in God, believe also in me, that is unmistakable that Jesus is saying, here's God and here's me. He is making himself equal with God. Anybody that tells you Jesus never claimed to be God has not read the book of John. It's right there again, again, and again. So Christ makes himself equal with God, and therefore Christ is worthy of the same trust. It's not just an intellectual knowledge, but it's, it's a warm, personal trust that we can have in him knowing that just as the Father, the covenant-keeping God, His promises are true, we know Christ's word is true, we know Christ's promises are true, and, and we're going to get into that more in a bit. So he says, don't be upset, don't be troubled, trust me. Why? Because in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. 
the house of the Father. Of course, we understand that to be heaven, the, the dwelling place of God. Now, interestingly, the only other place where in the book of John where Christ refers to his Father's house was in John 2.16 when he cleansed the temple. And he says, you made my Father's house a den of thieves. So he calls the earthly temple his Father's house because that is a picture of heaven. The tabernacle, remember, God gave the pattern to Moses on the mount. It's, it's a picture. It's all a type of heavenly things. Likewise with the first temple, and then the second was, was built after that pattern. So the, the temple served as a picture of heaven, but, but the Father truly dwells in the highest heaven. And the Old Testament clearly describes heaven as, as a physical place and the place where God resides. Let's look just at a couple of passages. Let's look in the, both in the book of Isaiah. Let's first turn to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1, the, the very famous vision of Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is filled with his glory. It speaks of the temple, but obviously this isn't the earthly temple. There's not seraphim flying all around there. This is the heavenly temple where the Father literally dwells. Let's go back to Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66, 1. Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me and where is the place of my rest? God literally dwells in highest heaven. So the Jewish disciples, they should have had some knowledge and some expectation of this. And heaven, Christ has revealed, that's, he was with the Father from eternity past. So heaven is where he has been from all eternity until he was incarnate there in Mary and then in Bethlehem. So he has been there and he will be returning there, he's saying. I'm going back to heaven. That's where I was. That's where I'm headed again. But it's a comfort for them because in his father's house are many mansions. The, the Greek word for mansion there is moni. And actually, it, it's from a verb that means to stay. The, it, it means a, an abiding place, a permanent residence. It's not in heaven. There's some tents. It's not mud huts. It is a rock solid mansion for us to stay in. And, and the book of Hebrews paints this out beautifully. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 11 first. Looking first at Abraham, Hebrews eleven ten. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Remember, Abraham lived his life in tents. He was a well-off man, but he was a nomad, never settling for any place permanently. But he looked forward to a place that had foundations. A tent doesn't have foundations. A tent's got some pegs in the ground. Even most of the cities of those days, they weren't digging down and building big footers. They just kind of build right upon the ground in, in many cases. But Abraham looked for something more permanent, a place to stay. Hebrews eleven sixteen. But now they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly, where God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Again, Abraham looked forward to a literal city in heaven to permanently dwell with God. Hebrews 13, 14. Hebrews 13, 14. For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. On this earth, might live in a, in a nice house, might think it's pretty sturdy, but we know it's all going to pass away. Even the great pyramids of Egypt, someday they're going to pass away, but we have the hope of a Moni, a permanent dwelling place that will never pass away. 
The only other place this word is mentioned is in this same chapter of John 14 and in verse 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come into him and make our abode. There's that same word with him. At salvation, when we receive Christ as our Savior according to the word of the Father, he dwells with us permanently. Once again, it's not a little while until you mess up sort of thing. It is a permanent dwelling place. He dwells with us and speaks of the seal of the Holy Spirit. He seals us until the day of redemption, until we go to dwell with Him permanently. This speaks of permanence and assurance. This is not something that can be defeated. This is not something that can be lost. So some people argue that a a mansion isn't the appropriate word, but friend, it's going to be far grander than anything we've seen. Some of you have been to Nice houses uh, up in Connecticut or, or Biltmore or someplace. But imagine what the Father is going to have for us. The, the grandness and the beauty, and if no, for no other reason, because it's in the presence of the Father. It will truly be a mansion for us. Christ says, if it were not so, I would have told you. He says, I'm giving you my word. Trust it. Christ promises us a place in heaven. It's Christ's word. Take it or leave it. I will take his word. And soon we're going to see that Christ is all truth. So there's no other one that we should believe. But then he does one better for him. He talked about, that's all great. There's these man- the fathers up there. There's these mansions all there. What does that do for them? He says, I go to prepare a place for you. Finally, it's all should be clear to them. The Father's house. That's where Christ is going. I go there, and He's going there for their benefit. He's returning to the Father's house. And, and, and then and now, heaven is, a, again, a physical place. Heaven is not just a spiritual existence. Heaven is not just some state of mind. Heaven is a real and physical place in the presence of the Father. And that's great. But the even better thing is why Christ is going away. He's not trying to get away from the disciples. He's not tired of the world and just trying to get away. He's going to prepare a place for them. And if he's preparing a place for them, that means they're going to be there. That means we're going to be there. What joy in that. He told them in John 13, 36, Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow but thou shalt follow me afterwards. He told you, can't come now, but you will someday. And now he's telling them where they're going. I'm going to heaven, I'm preparing a place, and you are going to be there with me. He's getting it ready for them. Not only do do the disciples and, and we get to go to heaven, not only do we get to see Christ, but we got a name, our name on the door somewhere. That, that, He cares for us, he knows us individually, and he has a place for us individually there. What greater joy, what greater comfort, what greater greater assurance could we have? That's Christ's residence. He is going to heaven. Second this morning, Christ's return in verses 3 and 4. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. It's what we call a conditional statement. If, then. If this happens, then something else will happen. Well, Christ has just made very, very clear he's going away and he's going to heaven. And he told them flat out he's going to prepare a place. So if I go and prepare a place, well, that's for sure. That means the second part is for sure as well. I will come again. It is certain that he will come again And his preparation is based on this promise. He said, I'm going to go prepare a place for you. Why would I do that if I wasn't going to come get you again someday? Christ isn't just going to be in heaven and we go meet him someday. We will spiritually, but he's going to bodily come back and we will bodily rise. And he will take us with him to heaven. Let's look at Acts chapter 1. 
Just back a few pages. Acts chapter 1, the ascension of Christ. Acts 1, 9 through 11. And when he had spoken these things, they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go to heaven." They had seen Christ return to heaven, and Christ is going to come back in the same way. He's going to come unto his own. That is the blessed hope of the church, the return of Christ. I will come again and receive you unto myself. When Christ returns for his own, he will receive us to himself. And that word receive, it's, I mentioned before the, the Greek We've got the active, which is I do something. We've got the passive, which is I, something is done to me. They have the middle, verse, voice, middle voice, which is I'm doing something either to myself or for myself on my own behalf. And this is the middle voice. That means Christ is intimately involved in it. It's not that Christ wants it done and he pawns it off on somebody else. It means Christ is personally taking us unto himself. It's just identifying how personal that action is to him. That idea to take, uh, it says receive, it's sometimes also rendered take. It's first used in Matthew 1.20 when, when God tells Joseph, fear not to take Mary thy wife unto thyself. The idea of marriage. Joseph took Mary as his wife. Christ is going to come receive us. He's going to come take his bride to be with him. We are identified as his bride, we're identified with him, and he is going to receive us just as Joseph received and took Mary. Now, throughout the Old Testament, there, there's many passages on the day of the Lord. And we know that speaks of Christ coming in his second advent and, and the, the, the tribulation hour which precedes that and the judgment that that's going to bring. But what great contrast this passage stands this is a passage of comfort that Jesus is just going to take his, his own unto himself and they're going to be in heaven, not coming on earth to rule and reign in judgment. So this is the first clear indication of, of the, the second advent of Christ being in two parts, that he's going to come in the clouds and at what we call the, the rapture, take the believers unto himself and go back to heaven. And then after that, seven years after, he's going to literally set foot on earth and bring judgment that is promised. So once again, he told the, the disciples the all of it discourse and all the judgment and trial at his second coming there. This is in stark contrast to that. So there must be a separation here. So this is the first intimation of the rapture of the church, distinct from his second coming in power. So he's going to come again. He's going to take us unto himself that where I am, there ye may be also. The disciples were going to be separated from Christ for a time. He was going back to heaven and they couldn't join him and be with him as they had been previously. But then when Christ takes his own unto himself at the rapture, we'll be joined with him, the whole church, from that point forward. And that is a new hope. Now, as I said, the Old Testament, there was the revelation of heaven, and they should have known about it, but the Old Testament hope is primarily earthly. Th think of Abraham. God's promises to him consistently, his hope wasn't in being with the Father in heaven, it was his posterity upon the earth. Think of the great resurrection pas passage of Job. What did he say? I will stand, I know my Redeemer liveth, and will stand in the latter day upon the earth. They knew of a future existence, but they mostly thought of it as earthly, and, and we know Abraham's bosom is within the earth. So they knew of heaven, and, and they knew uh, of a renewed existence on earth, but this is really a, a newly applied promise here of going with Christ into the Father's presence of heaven. And what a glorious hope that is being at the very throne of God. Where Christ is, the disciples and believers will be. We shall be. And that, that's, it's in the present tense. We will continually be. From that moment forward, it's a never-ending, constant association 
with Christ. Now let's look back at John 12, 26. A, a similar idea, but, but kind of a different slant on it. Christ says, if any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. This is a call to action of Christ. Christ is saying, what I do, my servant should be willing to go where I have gone, to go to, to take the gospel forth, to go even unto death in my name if needs be. So that's a challenge. But then on the flip side of that, we have the reward of being ever with Christ. When we, are, we will suffer persecution for the name of Christ or, or hardship or trial in this life, but then we are with Christ forever in glory in light of that. The place where Christ will be changes, but the saints will always be with him. Think about that. So from, we of course... Paul tells us that to be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord. So at our death, we spiritually go to him. But then the first time all believers in the church are gathered is at the rapture when our soul, if we've died before, our soul and body are rejoined. Those alive at that time are raised. So that's kind of the starting point when everybody is then together with Christ from the rapture. And he's going to take us to heaven. So we'll be in heaven with him as he promised. But what's happening seven years later from that? Christ is coming back to earth. But who comes with him? The armies of heaven, his saints on white horses will be with him coming back to defeat Antichrist. And, and we won't have to do anything. I mean, that'll be great. We'll be in the army, but we, we will watch him take care of it. But we will then be with him on earth for the millennial kingdom. And then when the new heaven and new earth come, we will be with him there as well. So he will, he will be moving about, but we will always be with him. So there, there is a notion that some teach that the, the millennial earth is just for Israel, that we are, as the church have a heavenly hope, so we're going to stay in heaven, and then saved Israel, they get the earth in the millennium, but Christ is going to be on the earth, and we're told we're going to be with him. So even though the millennium is specifically the, the fulfillment of promise to Israel, we as the church age saints will be, with the, will be there ruling and reigning with Christ as well. So we will never be separated from him again. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. They know where he is going because he just told them. They're, they're a little bit of a thick-headed bunch sometime, but he just told them where he is going. And again, this should have made sense from their Jewish upbringing and instruction. They should have known about the throne of the Father and something about heaven. Christ has taught them more and made it real explicit. So ye know where I am going. You know about heaven, the throne of the Father, and the way ye know. The, the word know here, it, it's not that gnosko that we often see, which means know by experience, because they hadn't experienced this. They hadn't been to heaven. This word means to, to know by seeing or to know by being taught. Well, they're being taught by Christ, so they ought to comprehend and know this. The way ye know... I don't think, I don't know how they spent all these years with Christ and, and not seen that he is the only way. They know he's going to heaven. The way ye know is by faith in him because he is the only revelation, the only access to the Father. But they're a little, they're a little thick on this. So then third this morning, we have Christ's road. He's going to have to lay out for them that he is the way. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Old Thomas. Thomas always wants more information. Thomas always wants proof in order to accept. But I think here he's really speaking for the group. I don't think any of them get it. Notice who doesn't speak up. Peter doesn't say a word. He's been stunned into silence by Christ predicting his denial. But Thomas speaks up and asks this thing. And I praise the Lord for Thomas speaking up because what a wonderful proclamation we're going to get. Just like Thomas doubting the Lord's resurrection, but that wonderful statement we get coming out of that, my Lord and my God. Well, today we're going to get one of Christ's greatest statements because Thomas doesn't understand. A glorious answer. Thomas claims, we don't know where you're going. I think the issue here is that they can't reconcile together everything that Christ has told them. 
he's told them he's departing and, and he's told them he's going to be betrayed and delivered up and they understand from that that he is going to die. And they can't reconcile his death with, with this glorious going to heaven and, and them coming with him and, and him returning for them. He, 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 he just can't wrap his mind around all these disparate facets of it. So, if we don't know where you're going, then how can we know how to get there? And how many people today are still like Thomas? We have now the full, complete revelation of God, and they still say, well, we can't really know what comes after death. We, we, don't, know how, we don't know how what's the right way, what's the wrong way to heaven, so we can't tell anybody you're doing it wrong. They, it, just like the disciples, they, we close our ears and ignore what Christ has clearly said. We don't need to ponder how to get there. Christ has said it. But here, he's going to make absolutely no bones about it. Verse 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way. Jesus doesn't even dignify the first question about where he's going with a response. He, he's made that clear. I'm going to heaven. But Thomas, if you want to know how to get there, there's one solution. I am the way. Christ asserts he is the way, the one and only means of access to heaven and to the Father. He is the roadway. He is the bridge that spans the uncrossable gulf between sinful man and holy God. He is the one and only way. As a, as a church, as a preacher, as people being witnesses, we can point to the way. We can tell people how to get to heaven. But Jesus is the way. He points to himself and says, I make the way of access. If you will, he's like Google Maps. It, it, it lights up the path. Well, he is the roadway and he lights up blue that says this is the one and only way. If your destination is heaven, this is the way to get there. There's no recalculating. There's no alternate route. This is it. They know this way because they've seen it. They have lived with Christ. They have looked upon Christ. And as Scripture tells us, He is the revelation of God. He was, no man has seen God at any time, but Christ who is in the bosom of the Father, He hath revealed God unto them. So they had seen the way. They had seen the path to heaven because they lived with Him. They would heard His teaching. He has given them everything that they need to know to have access and join Him in heaven. This I am statement, again, that's present tense. It's for then, it's for now, it's for all eternity. At any point in the timeline, Christ is the only way to heaven. It's true today just as it was then, the one and only way. Let's look back at Matthew chapter 7. The end here of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. We talk about the straight and narrow. They're, they're straight, it, it really means narrow. It means it's got defined boundaries. That doesn't mean it's limited. That doesn't mean that only some can get in. It is open to whosoever. Uh, just like in the, the tabernacle, there was, there was the, the white fence that went the whole way around and there was one gate in. Now that gate was 20 cubits. It was 30 feet wide. It was plenty of room for anybody that wanted to get in to get in. But it was the one and only way, and it had defined boundaries. And that's what Christ says. There's just one access point, and there is one road. It's like a limited access highway, like an interstate. It doesn't say only certain people can get on. Anybody that wants to can get on, but you can't get on wherever you want. You've got to take the on-ramp. Christ is saying there's one way to get on this road, and once you're there, it is the one and only way to heaven. Christ has made clear, I am the way, but he does them even better than that. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is truth and life. It's not that he is true and living. He is truth and life. There is none apart 
from him. Truth and life are eternal attributes of the person of God. Christ is truth first. Christ is the word of God. That's how John reveals him in the prologue. In the beginning was the word, the logos, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So we can apply statements of the word of God to Christ himself. Let's turn back to Psalm 119, 160. Of course, Psalm 119, the great psalm of the word of God. Psalm 119, 160. Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. The word of God and Christ is the perfect revelation, the word of God. So he is true from the beginning, and everything he says will stand. John 17, 17. From the mouth of Christ, sanctify them through thy word, Thy word is truth. The word of God is all truth. It is the source of all truth. God's word is the only infallible truth. All other things can change. All our, our understanding or knowledge might change, but the word of God stands like a rock undaunted, as the hymn says. It is the only source of truth. Likewise, Christ is life. It's not just he is living, but he is the embodiment and the source of all life. John 1, 4 says, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Christ is life. Christ was the active force in creation. He gave life, physical life, to all things that are alive, from, from the lowest microbe to, to mankind. But now in redemption, he is the source of all spiritual life. And let's just trace that briefly in the book of John. Let's go back to John chapter 3. Very familiar. What does he tell Nicodemus? John 3, 15. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse 36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. The Son is the one and only source of life. Then John eleven twenty five 25 and 26, Speaking to Martha after the death of Lazarus, John eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he and whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Jesus is the one and only way to eternal life. So these attributes of him, truth and life, they provide the light and the power to follow the way. He provides all that we need to follow the one way that is himself to go to God. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Literally, it could be no man comes to the Father if not by me. It's Christ or nothing. There's no in between. Now, this is totally exclusionary. There's no other way. There's no other truth. There's no other life that can give access. And that's where the world says, whoa, whoa, whoa. Who are you to say there's one way? Why is it my way? Why is it the way I want to do things? Why is it Allah's way and, and Buddha's way and, and, and the Hindi way? Why can't that way be okay too? This is a dogmatic statement. People don't like that. They don't like to be dogmatic. But friend... The truth is dogmatic. Two plus two equals four. That's a dogmatic statement because anything else is wrong. Two plus two doesn't equal three. 
And that just as true as any other way that we say you can get to heaven, if it's not by Christ, it is wrong. Christ made clear the one and only way. It's, it's not just be a good person. It's not believe in a God. It's not even believe in Jehovah God. It is believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ for salvation. The one and only way to bridge that gap. In the 1840s, Niagara Falls was uh, becoming a very, very popular tourist destination. People were, were starting to come from all over and, and visit. The problem is, you've got a giant waterfall. That's, there's a big river that's, that's turbulent, great gorges. It's awfully hard to cross from one side to the other. If you've been to Niagara Falls, you probably went over to Canada so you could get a better view. But, but there was no opportunity for that. So they, they realized that a bridge across the Niagara River would be a huge economic boon. And so people on both sides, the companies were founded, they were going to work together and do this thing. And generally how you start a bridge is you've got to have some line across. You've got to have some starting point. But where they wanted to go, it was, um, I think it was like 800 yards wide. It was a 200 yard deep gorge. How are they going to do it? Well, somebody had the bright idea. What if we make a contest? And whoever can fly a kite across... That's how we're going to do it. And so there was a 12-year-old boy. Um, I think his name was Harmon Good. He, he went over to the Canadian side, and, and because of ice flows, he got stranded there for 12 days. And his string broke a couple times, but he got his kite across. And just from that little kite string, they, they drew a rope and then a cable. And eventually they built the first bridge. But nobody could get across until a way was made. But for Christ, it wasn't a rope and a, a cable. He did it in one shot. Death and resurrection. He spanned that gulf that, that we couldn't even begin to get across. He is the bridge. On a bridge, there's no stopping. There's no turnoffs. You're on it and you're going where it leads. That is Christ Jesus in the Christian life. When He is our Savior, we are on the one and only way to heaven. We have seen this morning Christ's residence. He was leaving the disciples, but he was going to a far better place. He was going to his Father's presence in heaven, and he was going to prepare a place. Second, because he was going to repair a place, we saw Christ's return. He was going to come back for the him, them. He's going to take them, receive them to himself, and where they are, where he is, they're going to be, and we're going to be for all eternity. Third, we saw Christ's road. He is the one and only way of salvation. Christ gave this comfort to the disciples almost 2,000 years ago. But the comfort he gave them, the words he gave, because he is truth, it's good for us all today. We have the promise of Christ. So nothing in this world should be able to trouble us. Nothing should, should disturb us in a great way. Because we can give it over to Christ. We know that he is in heaven even now, preparing a place for those that put their faith in him. And just as surely we know that he is coming back for his own to lead them to heaven. Heaven is a beautiful promise, but he, by his death and resurrection, by the grace of God, is the only way to get there. I ask each and every one of you here, are you on that road? Are you on the way to heaven? If you would die or Christ would return today, could you, would, do you know for sure that you're going to heaven? Friends, you can. If you confess your sin and put your faith in the death and resurrection of Christ Jesus, if you pray to Him and do that, you will be saved and on your way to heaven. If you have done this, you have a mansion and you have the return of Christ to look forward to. What a glorious hope. But Christian friend, are you still feeling troubled? Do you, does your emotions still be stirred up? Know that the, the Christ who cared enough to die for you and has your eternity, He's got you today too. Don't be troubled. Believe in Him. Give whatever you're dealing with over to Him and He will surely see you through in the confidence and the light of His person. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You, Lord, for the promise of Christ. We thank You for the promise of heaven.
that he is there even now preparing a place, but we thank you that he made the way. We thank you that by your grace, any of us can come by faith and receive the salvation of Christ Jesus and have assurance of heaven, Lord. If there's, not, if there's one here who has never done that, I pray that you would help them to realize that apart from you, there is no other way. They have no hope of heaven. But if they will enter by that straight gate, if they will come in faith to Christ, that they can know their eternity is secure. If there's one here who's never done that, Lord, I pray that today might be the day of decision for them. Lord, I pray that you would speak to each believer here, that they would know that their heart does not need to be troubled. pray that you would meet them at the point of their need, reveal things they're trying to hang on to that's stirring up their emotion, that they would give them over to you even now, that they would believe in you, that you've got them today and through all eternity, Lord. Please speak to our hearts in this time. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord has put